Glycans really are critical in pretty much every major disease. You name a disease, I can probably tell you something about a sugar that might matter, right? So we have found that sugars are important in things like viral cell interactions. Um, this is an example of influenza. How many of you have had the flu? Fair number. You are the victim of a carbohydrate interaction and you didn't even know it, right? How many of you have taken Tamiflu? or any of these, the Relenza, any of these anti-flu agents, you've actually taken a drug that's based on a carbohydrate enzyme, right? So carbohydrates are already affecting you. You did not even know it, right? But in addition to that, if we look at things like, like COVID, right? It turns out that carbohydrates are co-receptors for COVID. And some of that research was done here at UAlberta with John Klassen's lab, with Matt McCauley's lab, um, where they found some really interesting things about the co-receptors for SARS-CoV-2. If you think about bacteria, our gut microbiome, another example of carbohydrates being really critical, right? They both help, they are the things that bacteria eat, they are the things that bacteria bind. They help do so many different things. Um, and, and not only in the area of human health, but if any of you got to see those scientific symposia with Wade Abbott, in agricultural health too. Um, they may be the key to sort of starting to figure out how to, how to raise livestock that maybe have less methane and all sorts of other things that are really cool. So, so lots and lots and lots of importance to carbohydrates. And yet again, hello, they're missing. So they're important in cell-cell interactions. So it's not just all about the pathogens. They're a part of how if you get an infection or, or if you get a, a wound, right? And you think, well, how do the white blood cells know where in the world I'm wounded? Turns out there's a carbohydrate signal that pops up on your blood cell, on your, on your endothelial cells and says, hey, look at me over here, I'm wounded. Could you come over here? And that's actually what tells your white blood cells to get there, right? So, so that is part of how wound healing actually occurs and how you get to sites of, of wounds as well. So, okay, so here comes the scary organic chemistry part because believe it or not, I actually am an organic chemist by training, I know. You're gonna be like, really? <laughs> And I taught organic chemistry and God, my students get scared. <laughs> so here's the thing, right? So I'm gonna show you some organic chemistry representation because I think it's good to know a little bit about how we scientists look at these molecules. So how many of you have actually ever taken organic chemistry? Couple, so at least a few of you will know kind of what this looks like, right? So these are what the carbohydrates or the monosaccharides that make up the mammalian glycome. So these are the sugars that are at the cell surface look like in organic chemical notation. Now, I don't know about you, but like if you look at, so galactose and mannose and food, if you're gonna try to tell those apart, like how are you gonna do that, right? That's complicated. And I'm not gonna ask you to. So instead, we have this wonderful thing called the symbolic nomenclature for glycomics, in which we use these really cute lucky charms. You know, it's like, Frosted Lucky Charms, they're magically delicious. Okay, so we aren't actually eating these ones, but we do have, you know, purple diamonds and uh, red squares and all sorts of things along those lines, but they actually represent real chemical structure. So don't be fooled, those cute cartoons actually have real meaning. And the difference between something like mannose, which is a C2 epimer here at the hydroxyl group, and galactose, which is C4, are really, really important biologically. They have very different functions biologically and they're recognized really differently. Okay, so, so this Lucky Charm version that I'm going to show you is not actually just a, a Lucky Charm version. It's an easy way for us to think about it, but remember that there's real structure behind that and real differences. So here's one of the things about these Lucky Charms is that when you see them in a two-dimensional Lucky Charm representation, you may not realize that the way that these things are connected is different, right? So in a triantenary oligosaccharide, and you're, you're like, what in the world is that? You don't really need to know, but what you do need to know is that there are different forms of connections. And when this mannose is, is connected to this glycnac in a beta 1, 6 representation, its structure looks like this. And when it's connected in a beta 1, 4 representation, its structure looks like this. And, you know, even from a straightforward pattern recognition point of view, you can see that those are different. And in fact, biology recognizes them differently. Lectins, so carbohydrate binding proteins, so proteins that, are, that plants make that recognize this sugar, don't recognize this sugar. Okay, so even that simple change can have profound influences on biology. So I'm going to make it even more fun. So, we have, so thanks to the work of my fabulous admin, Tavea Adam, who actually literally was working on stuff for Gia 
Um, right next to her fabulous sister, Haley Adam, who's a graphic designer, uh, they came to me with this idea of maybe making the glycans into cartoons. And I was like, that's great. So um, with some help, Haley made us the glyco gang, which is a new way to start thinking about this symbolic nomenclature for functional glycomics and actually putting a little bit of fun on it. Right? So meet the glyco gang. We have the glicnac, galnac, fucose, galactose, iduronic acid, which interestingly is the only sugar that is not actually put onto, uh, is not biosynthesized into carbohydrates, but rather it is already in a complicated carbohydrate and is then altered to be hydronic acid. And in fact, it derives from glucuronic acid. This cool guy over here actually ends up making this one. And then we have glucose sialic acid, one of our favorites here. In fact, all the sialic acid keychains completely ran out because everybody loves it so much. Um, mannose, glucuronic acid, and xylose. And you'll notice a little bit of a color pattern here, like galnac and galactose are related. Okay, so galactose, which is yellow, is related to galnac, which is yellow. The yellow square means it's an N-acetyl sugar, and the yellow circle means that it's not, okay? And glycnac and glucose are related. So how many of you have heard of glucose? Well, a few of you, right? Diabetes, this is like the sugar you're all thinking about, you're right? Like, okay, sugar, clearly she's talking about glucose. Um, no, <laughs> actually, we're not really going to talk about glucose. So the sugars that you eat are, are kind of the simplified things like blood glucose is, is, you know, is the sugar here, but that's only such a small piece of the carbohydrate world. It's like talking about proteins and saying, I'm only going to talk about alanine. I'm not going to talk about it in the context of a protein. I'm only going to talk about alanine, right? That's it. That's the entirety of proteins. So the same way, that's, that's kind of like saying glucose is the entirety of sugars. It's so far from it, right? In thinking about how we start to think about this code, I'm going to do a little bit of basic teaching about like how this code actually happens. So we have a lot of different proteins and lipids that these sugars are attached to. In fact, most of your cell surface proteins and your secreted proteins that are in your blood are glycosylated. They have sugars on them. And that actually incredibly uh, alters their functions. It can change the way they interact with things. They're incredibly important. And there are a lot of different flavors. So glucose, our friend glucose here, is actually at the heart of what we call glycosphingolipids. There's a lot of great research here at the university in glycosphingolipids. I'll highlight a little bit of it at the end. Our friend glycnac here is actually both on O-glycnac, which is inside the cell, but also the core of N-linked glycans, which is oftentimes what we talk about in carbohydrates. Our friend galnac here is actually the core of O-linked glycans as we like to think of, I should say canonical O-linked glycans. So you're thinking, well, what's the difference between an N-linked and an O-linked glycan? N-linked are on nitrogens, starting with N, right? Um, which are on things called asparagines, whereas O-links are on serines and threonines, which have, as you might expect, an oxygen, right? And that's the difference between N and O. Then we have things that also have, so we have like, TSR domain, like our friend Foucault here is actually at the core of, uh, of certain o uh carbohydrates. This is actually a relatively new finding in the field. Our friend Manos here, who's happy in this picture, is actually at the core of OMAN domains. These are actually really important biologically. For example, how many of you have heard of muscular dystrophies? Right? Did you know that disorders in which that O-Manos are disrupted actually cause some of the muscular dystrophies? Again, sugars being really, really critical in basic, basic aspects of biology. Xylose, our star. So xylose is actually part of, it's the core part of proteoglycans. So how many of you ever heard of heparin, right? So blood thinners, if you've ever had to take a blood thinner, you've taken a carbohydrate. Heparin is, a, is an example of a proteoglycan or a glycosylaminoglycan actually. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a carbohydrate, right? And when, when heparin derivatives are on uh, proteoglycans, they are attached by the silos, as are chondritins, as are dermatins. Some of you may have heard of dermatins because they put them in skincare products, right? You've probably heard of hyaluronic acids. They talk about skin, another glycan, right? They're in your beauty products. They're in the things that you use medically. Again, right? Like, and you haven't even really heard of them. How crazy. So this is our glyco gang, and they look all happy, and they're like the glyco gang, right? They're the fun gang. Or are they? right? Or are they the glyco gang? So as with many things in life, context is everything in sugars, right? Not just are they O or are they N, but also like, 
You know, who are they next to? Who are they attached to? What proteins are they on? You know, what, what's the neighborhood look like? Do you have too much of it? Do you have too little of it? Do you have just right, right? It's a, a little bit like Goldilocks, right? You, ha you have to get into the, into the Goldilocks zones with sugars. So we're gonna talk about a few sort of stories that have evolved from my lab, and then I'm gonna give you a little bit more of an idea of what we at the Glycomics Institute of Alberta are gonna be doing to start unlocking this code. So I'm gonna tell you first a tale of two fucoses. Is it good? Is it not so good? How do we know? How do we even figure out that this is involved? So how do we decode the glycome? Now, there are many ways to decode the glycome, and I'm not going to claim to be using all of them because we're absolutely not. But in my lab, we actually created a, a methodology to do this, and we call it lectin microarrays. And it's our secret decoder ring. I like thinking of it as our secret decoder ring for the glycome. So lectins, which are these carbohydrate binding proteins. So these are proteins. Um, they're made by plants. Some of them are natural lectins in your body. Uh, they're made by bacteria. Um, we also, admittedly, in our lab, use antibodies on the array that also bind lectins. <laughs> We're no longer just lectins anymore. But what they basically do is they bind substructures within sugars. So they bind bits of the sugar that are controlled by very specific enzymes that also control then very specific biology. So in my lab, quite a few years ago now, we created a technology, and this is the fancy science slide, that we call lectin microarrays. And it's a really simple idea. You have something that binds the very specific bits of something, right? It's like, it's like it can see bits of the elephant, right? And what we're doing is we're putting all those binders on a single platform, right? Which we call a microarray. So little tiny spots of them all over this platform. And then we throw the elephant on. In this case, we label the elephant and throw it on, right? And then we see what bits stuck, right? And actually, to be fair, we throw two elephants on. We, we throw one, <laughs> that's the, the sort of sample that we're looking at, and the other one is actually um, a reference so that we can compare the two, right? So we're, we're trying to see, well, is it an elephant and a hippo, <laughs> right? Is it an elephant and an elephant? Like, what are we really looking at here? And then because these things bind differently, the sugars actually bind differently, we can look at what we call the glyco pattern and get really complicated molecular information. Okay, somebody obviously has to leave, but anyway, get complicated molecular information out, right? So, so now we're gonna get these, these things that look, you know, this is what the organic chemist would look at. This is what I prefer looking at because it's just so much faster to try to understand, right? But we start to get really complicated molecular information out that then tells us what enzymes might be going wonky, right? What might be going wrong in the glycome? What might we be able to target? How is this changing? So, our tale of two fucoses begins um, with the amazing Ava Hernando Mange, who is a friend and colleague of mine at NYU Langone, who is a melanoma biologist. She's a cancer biologist, and she's been very interested in trying to understand what is it that makes melanoma metastasize, right? Because if you have melanoma, and some of you may have had one, and you've had it removed, right? And it's primary, that's what we call a primary melanoma, you're fine. Right, like 90% of people who have melanoma, they're absolutely fine. But some subset don't get caught early enough, right? And it does what we call metastasis, which means that these cells go from this tiny little primary site and they start going to your lymph node and under your skin. And with melanoma, they have a very high propensity of landing in your brain, okay? Which makes it incredibly deadly. About, you know, I think even now with the latest drugs, it has, you know, about a five-year survival right? That's still only about 30%. Not great, right? Not great. And that's a great improvement over the 16% that it was before they had the latest drugs, okay? But that gives you an idea with the, some of the problems with melanoma and what makes it something that we still really struggle to understand. All of this understanding that we've brought to the table and we still can't solve this problem, right? And I would like to convince you that part of why is that we're ignoring things like the glycome. So what we did is we used our lectin microarray and you get what we call this like a pattern. And you're like, this is completely meaningless to me. And that's okay, because we're gonna, we're gonna focus in here. But, but what I'm gonna tell you is that the stuff over here is the primary melanoma and the stuff over here is the metastasis. And these colors are different levels of sugar binding. So this is, so blue is low sugar binding and, and yellow is high sugar binding. And at a very basic level, what you can see is that the primary and the metastasis look really different, right? Like you don't need to do any, anything more than that. You just know they're different, right? Like cancer is like a huge glycomic changes, 
right, in metastasis. And that, that's complete. And these, by the way, are human samples. These are paired patient samples from about 17 patients. Okay, so they're the primaries and the melan and the metastases from the same patient. Okay. And what we see is Foucault's, Foucault's, in the context of being on this glic -nac at the core of N-linked glycans, is going up in melanoma metastasis, right? It's increasing. But Foucault's, Foucault's, our one, two Foucault's, which is with our friend Galactose over here, is actually doing the opposite. It's decreasing. Which gets to my point from earlier, right? Context is everything, right? Sugars are not sugars are not sugars. <laughs> Context is everything. So if we do an assay to look for migration, so one of the things that we know about metastasis, right, is that the cells have moved, right? They used to be in one primary location somewhere, and they have, like, they've skedaddled. They're all over the place now. So if we, if we look at a migration assay, that kind of is a very rough, cell culture replica of what that looks like. It's, it's absolutely not, you know, real human metastasis, but it gives us an idea of some basic features of a cell, like can it move, right? So this is a transwell assay. So you put cells in the top and you have a well here and there's a little membrane here that has some, you know, some um, various compounds that help to like make the cells stick and, and things like that. And you look to see like how many of the cells actually moved through. And that's called a transwell migration assay. And so what we see is if we have our, our Foucault, that's the, the not so good Foucault, and we silence the enzyme that makes it, all of a sudden this isn't moving so much, right? But if we take our happy Foucault and we silence it, all of a sudden it's moving a lot, right? And what that means is silencing just these single genes, the ones that actually make the bad Foucault's, well, I wouldn't really call it bad Foucault's, but in this context, bad Foucault's, right? Is actually preventing that migration, which is a hallmark of metastasis. And silencing the one that's the good Foucault's is actually causing migration which is a hallmark of metastasis, right? So these sugars aren't just these silent partners that are reporting on things, they're actually functionally changing the way the cells behave in a way that very much follows what we're seeing in human patients, okay? And I'm, there's a lot of science that I'm basically showing in three slides. This paper is a monster. If you really wanna read the scientific work, it's in this cancer cell paper. I'm happy to tell you all the gory details of it, but for this talk, I'm not, okay? So if we look at a mouse model and we say, okay, well, you know, that's nice. That's migration in a cell. What happens in an animal, right? And if in this mouse model, we silence our unhappy Foucault's after we've injected these cells into the mice. So now we're letting them sort of do micro dissemination and we're trying to see, can we you know, stop the actual progression of metastasis? What we find is if you look at a scramble, you can see this poor mouse, all of these like colors, those are the cancer all over the place, it's awful. Um, you treat them with doxycycline, which, which actually turns off this enzyme, but this is a scramble, so it does nothing and it's all over the place and it's awful. You treat it with this, uh, what, this is an siRNA, but it's inducible, so it's not turned off here, so the sugar isn't turned off here, and it's all over the place and it's awful. But you turn off the sugar, you turn off the sugar, and the mouse no longer has significant metastasis, right? And so what that tells us is that this thing that we're seeing in human patients, this thing that people have been treating as if it's not important, has real functional relevance, right? And may really be part of the missing links to start thinking about how we treat things like melanoma, okay? And it also goes back to Foucault's is not Foucault's is not Foucault's. Okay, so that was my first story. So the second mystery is Manos. Is it our friend or is it our foe? This is our happy Manos right, our happy mannose. And it turns out that we have these, these carbohydrates called high mannose. You can see a little glicknag from lots of mannoses here, right? And it turns out that these sugars are often seen on viruses which hijack our processes, right? And as a result, they often have these sugars on the viral particle. For example, flu has high mannose on it. 
and COVID has high mannose on it, right? So a lot of viruses have this because of the way that they get trafficked through our cells, out our, out, out our cells, and, you know, because we're basically making them. Yeah, like the viruses come from us. They can't replicate without us, okay? So we basically make them, and when we make them, we tend to put mannose on them, right? And you know, it's kind of a good thing because we have an entire series of what are called innate immune lectins. And these are sugar binding proteins that bind high mannose. And what do they do? They take the viruses out, right? Like that's their function. So in this case, mannose is great, right? And you think, great, mannose is clearly protective. These lectins are clearly protective. Or are they? So, I was lucky enough to be in a, this amazing study um, with Elodie Geddon, who's a viral genomicist, and Ted Ross, who is a virologist um, and clinician scientist down at the University of Georgia, and Elodie was at NYU. And what they were really curious about was, okay, why is it that some people die of flu? So this was actually pre-COVID, so weirdly enough, I was looking at severity and pandemic models before COVID hit, <laughs> which made for a very weird experience when COVID hit, and all of a sudden we're doing more than just flu, right? So, okay, so we were looking at this model. And so the model that we were using to look at this is a ferret model. And the one thing I'll say about severity in any pandemic, right, is that the truth of it is, is we're not gonna outwit evolution, right? Evolution's always gonna get us. Viruses are really fast at mutating. So the question is, why is it that some select subset of us actually have these reactions where we die, right? Can we stop that? Because, and that has to do with us. And the truth of it is we evolve slowly, Like we are not that fast, right? Viruses, they replicate like this. We've all seen living evidence of this in the variants, right? Like it, it happens so fast. We, we mutate relatively slowly, right? We're, we're generations, it takes a bit. Okay, so the thing is, what is it about us? Can we figure out how to make it so that viruses don't kill us? So that's part of what we were trying to look at. So we looked at the ferret model, and in the ferret, these poor ferrets were separated into three groups. There were those that were infected and had what we call mild disease, which means that they didn't lose much weight, they looked okay. There were the moderate, and then there were the, oh my God, what the hell just happened? I was hit by a Mack truck version of the disease. Okay, so that's what we call the severe. And so we sacrificed the ferrets. <laughs> <laughs> and we took their lung tissue and we looked to see what was different between the mild and the moderate and the severe. And what we found was high mannose. High mannose was really high in those severe ferrets. So, okay, wait a minute. I thought that was supposed to be protective. What in the world's going on here? If we looked at the tissue of those poor severe ferrets, you could see that this red stuff, this red stuff is the staining for high mannose and it's every. It's everywhere, like it's all over the place, okay? So it really is just really high in these severe tissues. If you look at uninfected tissues, you know, it's, it's really in very, very select places. The thing is that this mannose didn't just mark ferret cells. When we took human bronchial epithelial cells, so this is, you know, you can get primary bronchial epithelial cells. So these are from patients who allow you to, you know, take some of their cells um, and, and then you infect them with influenza. So these bottom ones have the flu, the top ones don't. And you look for this because it's red, but you can kind of see it here in the co-localization. But what you'll see is without the flu, there's not really much high mannose, right? But with the flu, all of a sudden you have high mannose. And you're like, wait, okay, that kind of makes some sense because maybe just maybe, maybe it's marking these damaged tissues, right? And that that's part of it. Like, it, like wouldn't it be good that it was a damage marker? And in fact, the lectin MBL2 right, which is that same lectin, one of our innate immune lectins that recognize high mannose and wipe out influence particles, actually recognizes the infected cells. So here we have infected cells, and here we have the mannose, the MBL2 binding. This is an example of a cell that was treated with an enzyme called endo-H. It cleaves off those mannoses, and you notice the MBL2 doesn't recognize anymore. And here's the funny thing about MBL2. We had this result of high mannose, and I was sitting in a talk on schizophrenia. And it turns out that schizophrenics have unusually high levels of what are called complement proteins. And one of the things that's the beginning of what we call the lectin complement pathway is MBL2. So I was curious, and I looked up in the literature, you know, do schizophrenics have high levels of MBL2? And the answer is yes. And then I said to myself, well, I'm curious, is there any epidemiological data on death rates of schizophrenics from things like flu? 
Turns out there's a huge database that has like thousands of people in it, and that people who have schizophrenia die of influenza and pneumonia at a seven to eight fold higher rate than the general population. Right? So this high manos thing, like it's probably not just ferrets. But just say it. You know, obviously we cannot take lung tissue from people because that would be wrong. Okay, we have ethics, we don't do stuff like that. <laughs> so so we can't quite look at it that way, but the biological evidence kind of argues that this is important. And in fact, people who had the H1N1 pandemic 09 virus, who were in critical care, if they had high levels of MDL2 in their blood, were more likely to die. Okay, again, arguing that this is probably part of a very real biological mechanism. And in fact, we think that this might be a point of intervention in influenza, like thinking about the complement pathway and what's happening in you know, in sort of inflammation, what happens when you're getting recognized? And I think part of the problem is if you have too much MBL2 or you have too hyperreactive an airway and you have more of that high manus come up, right? Or you have a combination of the two. And there are many reasons why that could occur, right? You might be more likely to die from the flu. And the thing that we found is that all of the influenza seem to cause this. And based on the pathways we looked at, we hypothesized that influenzas that cause more death are probably going to cause much more of this response. So this may be something that we can start thinking about making not antivirals, because we're not going to stop getting infected, right? But you can think of it as anti-death agents, right? That'd be good, an anti-death agent. Right? So, so this is part of what we're starting to think about is how can we start to leverage this information to make it so that we just don't get so damn sick when pandemics come through, okay? And there's our happy manos because, you know, the flu gets knocked out. And there's our maybe not so happy manos because, you know, a little too much of it, not so good. Okay. And so then the, the last sort of set of stories I'm going to tell you has to do with the many many secrets of sialic acid. And I have to say, sialic acid is a very popular sugar here at the University of Alberta. You will see many, many, <laughs> I know some of my colleagues are laughing. They're like, yes. They're like, oh yes, we do love sialic acid, <laughs> right? And, and, and before I get started on this, I do have to do a little bit of a shout out. Um, so I had the privilege of being Professor Carolyn Bertozzi's very first PhD student. And in Carolyn's lab, um, I worked on da, 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 sialic acid. <laughs> and what we did is we actually did the very first um, example of being able to do metabolic engineering and use bioorthogonal chemistry at the cell surface. But the chemistry we used was ketones and hydrazides. Because at the time, all of this beautiful chemistry that um, Bertozzi, Meldal, and Sharpless got the Nobel Prize for hadn't been created. And part of the reason they did create it, or the reason that Carolyn created it, is because of the fact that she wanted to be able to do this in living organisms. And we could do it in cell culture, but the chemistry wasn't good enough for actual, you know, living um, organisms. So looking in mice or looking in, lives, in uh, live animals. So, and you can see that this is bioorthogonal chemistry. It's going, a lot of the original work was through the sialic acid by a synthetic pathway, and it's illuminating the cell. You can actually light it up with these beautiful compounds. And so um, I'm very, very, I have to say, everybody says this about Carolyn, but she really is an amazing mentor um, and just an amazing professor. So, although congratulations to all of them, but especially Carolyn. <laughs> So, okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of our own sialic acids, and this comes back to using that lectin microarray to look at human samples, but in this case, comparing them to mouse models, because one of the dirty little secrets of biology is that mice are not people, right? And you're thinking, well, why is that a dirty little secret? Because we can cure cancer in mice. Man, we're really good at it, right? Like, we're really good at it, but we can't really quite do it in people yet, right? So... Why? Why are mice not people? We have all these things we have in common. Why are they not people? Well, you know, the way that we use sugars is part of where we are really different. You know, not only in the sugars that most of our sugars are the same, there are a couple of subtle differences, but really the way that we use it isn't exactly the same. You know, that same code is a little bit different in the different organisms. And the way that they're regulated is a little bit different. So one of the things that we're really interested in my lab is trying to understand when can we use models and when can't we? And so we had this wonderful opportunity to work with Emma Kurz, who's an MD PhD in Daphne Barsagi's lab, and my student, Shi Wei Chen, to look at a cancer model called the KC mouse model. Now, the KC mouse model is a model of pancreatic cancer. How many of you know Ruth Bader Ginsburg? 
How many of you know she died of pancreatic cancer? Right? She died of pancreatic cancer. It is one of the most terrible cancers to try to cure. You don't find it until it is stage three or four. So the KC mouse model is actually not a late stage model. It's an early stage model. And it's really important because we don't have human samples for early stage, right? Like if we did, we might be able to stop the damn thing, but we don't. Right? So, so how do we try to figure out what's happening early on in cancer? We use mice. But the problem is like, they're not people. So what can we and can't we model in this mouse? So to look at that, we looked at human pancreatic cancer. And now this is late stage. So, so there is a little bit of a disconnect there that we can't prevent, right? And we looked at their glycome and we looked at the KC mouse model and we looked at its glycome. And what we found is that a subset of the carbohydrates were elevated in both the mouse and in the um, human. And in particular, sialic acid. Okay, so yes, this is our villainous sialic acid, right? And we particularly focused on a sugar called 2,6-sialic acid, which is this one right here. So if we look at cancer, these are actually human cancer samples from a tissue microarray. Here's a normal pancreas, and this yellow staining uh, is for SNA, is the lectin that binds this 2,6-sialic acid. And you can see, like, there's almost nothing, right? Like, there's not really very much in a normal pancreas, not much staining. There's a little bit here and there. If you look in a stage one, two PDACs, this is a very rare sample that we actually have a little bit of it. You can see already there's tons of sialic acid and also the enzyme that makes it is, is up there too, right? And then if you look at later stages, you also see a ton of, of sialic acid. And so, so again, very grumpy sialic acid being made by this ST6 gal one in particular. So Emma, who is this amazing, amazing MD PhD student. So the KC mouse model is a very funny model. So well, not very funny, but it's an interesting model because basically what they do is they put a mutation that happens in humans into the cells that only become the pancreas, right? So the rest of the, the mouse is fine, right? It's just the pancreas that's a total mess, okay? And so what she did is she knocked out ST6 gal one only in those same cells. Okay, so the entire mouse still has it, but those cells do not. And so what happens? So when you knock out ST6 scale one, this is what the normal model looks like. And you can, I mean, even I can look at that and go, yeah, that looks so great, right? It's all blubby, right? Like you can see all this gray stuff, that's fibrosis. It's not good, right? That does not look like a smooth, good tissue for a pancreas. But if you knock out ST6 scale one, you actually preserve that tissue for much, much longer arguing that really 2,6-sialic acid is a co-driver of pancreatic cancer. And indeed, it's also involved in metastasis, which other groups have shown, right? So really, 2,6-sialic acid is something that's a through line throughout the entire life cycle of pancreatic cancer and may provide, again, a new way of thinking about how we start to prevent this, how we start to treat it, right? How we start to turn this back in ways that we haven't even begun to look at the biology of. These things, again, they're not just things that just so kind of happen to be along. You know, these are things that are integral parts of the biology. They're fundamentally changing this biology. Okay, so the other sialic acid tale I'm going to tell you from my lab actually has to do with COVID. So this is a little bit more nerdy, I admit. I'm going to show you a little bit more detail on this one. So this was actually work done here at the University of Alberta um, with plasma samples from the second wave of COVID, which is actually still the first version of COVID, right? Because we kind of had that little bit where we all unmasked and then all of a sudden it got worse again. Yeah, it's that wave. Okay, so what we have is we have plasma samples from, from patients who are mild. We don't have very many just because we didn't get very many. Um, moderate or hospitalized with oxygen or intensive care. And we're calling that severe. And we compared them to a negative cohort um, that was from our University of Georgia vaccine studies, which I'm not gonna tell you about because there's way too much stuff we work on. I would make your head spin. It makes my head spin. You know, as I said, I have an amazing lab. So what we did is we decided that we wanted to look at glycosylation in these different samples. And so my student, Rickin, who I think may be here in the audience, um, actually looked at, at the, the electron microarray, and I'm going to make a long story short, and our friend 2,6-sialic acid came up, and it was high in severe, okay? So these, this cohort, by the way, they had no infections. This is pre-pandemic samples, so there was no way that they were infected. And we found a higher levels of 2,6-sialic acid with severity. Now, I will cop to the fact that the end numbers are a little low. Okay, because yes, they are. Sometimes you have to make do with the clinical samples you get. It's not ideal, 
<laughs> right? And you absolutely cannot say you absolutely definitely know this is a marker for severity, but it doesn't mean you can't find some interesting biology with it. Along with the end numbers being low, I happen to, you know, still have a student at NYU, which was Shi Wei Chan, and, and she and uh, Emma Kurz, and, and again, so Rick, Emma, and Shi Wei are all co-first co authors on this, which is why all their names are listed. So she and Emma Kurz were able to look at autopsy samples from people who died in New York City in the very first wave of COVID. And this was work with Amy Rapowitz, who was the pathologist who was doing biosafety level three autopsies. Right, so this is a really rare sample set. You never get access to something like this. This is a crazy sample set. And so we actually had access to these, like to these very sad samples actually, because every time I think about them, they honestly make me feel really, really sad. But we were able to look at um, glycosylation in the heart, kidney, liver, and the upper lower lobe of the lung of people who died of COVID-19 and compare them to people who died of other causes. Okay, that also had respiratory involvement. So one of the things I want to point out here, and part of why I'm showing the slide where you can't tell a damn thing, is pattern recognition. So I don't know about you, but I can tell the difference between the heart, the kidney, the liver, and the lungs from looking at these patterns, which are all sugar-based. And what that tells me is that these myths that people often say about, oh, glycosylation, it's so variable, why do you study it, blah, 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 blah. Um, no, <laughs> right? Because these people died of different causes, right? They have different blood types. They're from different walks of life. They're male and female. And I can tell their organs by looking at their glycomes, right? Which means that glycosylation really is informing us about both who you are, right? And how you're doing, right? Self state and self status. Both of those are encoded in the glycome, much as they are in many other biomolecules, right? Getting back to our story about sialic acid, though, when we looked at 2,6-sialic acid, we found that in the lower lobe of the lung, which when you have a severe respiratory infection, that's where the bad stuff happens, right? If it gets to damaging the lower lobe of your lung, that is not a good sign. In the lower lobe of the lung, we saw increased levels of 2,6-sialic acid. Same thing that we had seen in the blood of people with severe COVID. Okay, and when we look at the autopsy samples, what you can see, it's a little hard to see because again, screen, right? The red, sorry about this. Um, but what you can see is that you see that the 2,6-sialic the acid, which here is in red, is lining the airways. Now these are autopsy samples, so the morphology, any of you who do histochemistry, is not so great because these, you know, there are reasons, right? We don't, want to, we don't want to really think about that too deeply, but there are reasons. But what we can definitely say is that lining the airways, we see a lot of enrichment of 2,6-sialic acid. And it turned out that we did some proteomics. So we decided, well, you know, we went back to our plasma samples and we said, okay, we have this signature. And the great thing about lectins is you can use them as probes to pull down the proteins that this signature is on. It's called glycoproteomics. And when we did that, we found out that this signature is enriched on a series of proteins called complement. So complement is that, that lectin complement pathway I was telling you about earlier that does all that damage. Complement is the downstream thing that both the antibody-mediated pathway and the lectin-mediated pathway converge on, okay? So when you have antibody-mediated cell damage, it's through the complement pathway most often, okay? So this pathway has a lot of these proteins, and they're actually, it's a really complicated, weird cascade of proteolytic cleavage, which I'm not going to boggle your mind by going through, but what I will say is that all of these proteins in squares, so all these circles that have squares on them, all had 2,6-sialic acid, and lots of them are, mem are members of what are called the membrane attack complex, which is exactly what it sounds like, right? It attacks your membranes and disrupts them and does all sorts of really not so good stuff. And so what we found was that when we looked in the lungs of those autopsy patients, we found that these complement proteins, so this is the COVID negative, you can see there's not much complement, but in the COVID positive, these complement proteins were in the same locations that we saw the enhanced sialic acid. Now, what does that mean? Can I give you a definitive answer? Well, welcome to science, no, right? <laughs> like, wish I could tell you we knew everything, but then I'd be out of a job, so maybe not, 
right? So what I can tell you is that this really is bringing up the idea that we need to start thinking about glycosylation and what it's doing on these proteins and how that might be impacting things like, you know, how antibodies and, and the lectin complement system are converging to do damage in tissues in severity. And again, it may add to another point by which we might be able to prevent severe infections, right? How does this work? We do not know. This is actually literally hot off the presses uh, data. This just got published, I think, last week in ACS Infectious Disease, it got posted. So what I think you can get from this, though, is that, you know, we don't know what the complement glycosylation does, but we think it may be important. This is actually a very, I feel like you talk about underexplored. This is a hugely underexplored research area. And we know that I think all of this tells us that glycosylation, among the many things it does, right, actually both reports on and can influence host response. Okay, which, you know, given all of the stuff that we've been looking at lately, kind of important. And by the way, and I'm not going to talk about it, it also can potentially alter vaccine response, which we've actually shown in flu. We've shown correlations, but we think that there may be more of a causation as well that we are not yet, you know, we're still trying to figure out if there's a method to the madness of, because we think that it may help to figure out ways in which vaccines can be better. And I'm actually working with it with the CIVIC, which is the um, Collaborative Institutes for Vaccine and, uh, and Influenza Centers. I can never remember what the acronym is, but it's a huge NIH initiative to make better vaccines for pandemics, in particular, in this case, for pandemic flu. That is what my lab does. Or actually, that's only half of what my lab does, but the rest of it was too esoteric to tell you. So. I want to tell you a little bit about what the Institute has going on, because there's so many awesome people here at the university, and this is why we had to create an Institute, right? To bring them all together. So meet our Glyco gang. But I'm going to say that they are not villains, <laughs> okay? They are definitely the good guys. So for example, Simonetta Scipioni, who is the Associate Director of GIA, she is helping to crack the glyco code by looking at glycolipids in the brain. So remember when I was talking about how those glycans can be on lipids and how the glucose can help you on there? Really early on, you're like, no, I have no idea what she's talking about. It's okay. Okay. But the brain has a ton of glycolipids, in particular, sialylated glycolipids. And in this case, they're really good. And it turns out that this one called GM1 may give us clues to help people with, with, with neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's. So in some of the work that, that Simonetta's lab has done, she has shown that uh, giving mice GM1 who have Huntington disease, who have a Huntington disease model, actually seems to alleviate Huntington's and other sort of neurodegenerative diseases in that, in that form, right? So this is just, again, part of why we need to start looking at glycosylation. Here is John Claussen. So continuing in this case with the image, with the, uh, GM1 theme. So he is a mass spectrometrist who does a lot of really cool work trying to create new methods to look at the glycome and to look at binding and to look at all of the esoteric things that sound esoteric until you're trying to create a drug, right? Or you're trying to figure out where the hell something is. Um, and one of the things that he's showing, so I'm showing you some, some data from his lab that's one of the cool new techniques he's working on, is mass spectrometry-based imaging of the glycome. In this case, this is some of his work in glycosphingolipids. Here is Chris Cairo, who I see in our audience. <laughs> so Chris, he's got the happy sialic acid. So this is a story from Chris, Chris's lab, where in this case, so, so, you know, in heart disease, you often get these atherosclerotic plaques, right? You get these fat deposits that are really awful, right? And, and, and we all know that cholesterol, not so great, right? So there's LDL and we have to think about cholesterol. And so Chris, uh, with his collaborators, has been working on the fact that this cholesterol is often wrapped in a protein that is highly, highly sialylated. And so Professor Cairo's lab works on these enzymes called neuraminidase that remove that sialic acid. But that's not such a good thing because when that happens, it seems like it, they go into certain cell types that are then causing the formation of these atherosclerotic plaques. And so his lab has created these awesome inhibitors against this, this sialidases, and when you add them, so this is the mouse model, and you can see that you get these awful looking plaques, and these little red things are kind of big, but when you add the inhibitors, you're noticing like these are getting much, much thinner, right? And that's good. So this may actually open up whole new ways of treating heart disease, right? Which is some pretty cool work. Here's Lisa Willis. So she is one of the youngest members of the Glycomics Institute of Alberta. And she works on a very cool 
sialic acid called polysialic acid. And polysialic acid helps to tune our immune system. And she found that men, so this is a difference between the sexes, men have a lot more polysialic acid in their sera than women do. And interestingly, men have a tendency to have a less activated immune system than women do. And so her lab hypothesizes that this may be part of why, right? And so she's trying to figure out like, how does this work, right? But not only that, she's been looking into different diseases, and this is an example of a terrible disease called scleroderma, which is a horrible disease that, that people get. It's often fatal. And she's found that this polysialic acid is not there in normal skin, but is actually popping up in these scleroderma patients, right? And she's been working on things like inhibitors for this and ways that eventually we can maybe even start beginning to treat these patients. She's at the very, very beginning of this work, but it is a really, really cool and exciting area. And I really look forward to seeing what she does. And then here's Matt McCauley. So he's another member of our glyco gang, and he works on a series of proteins known as CGLEX. And they often bind sialic acids to tune down the immune system. And CGLEX are involved in a lot of different things. Um, and there was so much on that slide that I'm sorry, Matt, I had to pick one. <laughs> but one of the things that they're involved in is in controlling our ability to make antibodies by controlling the way that B cells are in germinal centers and, and the way that they mature to make antibodies. Okay? And it turns out that if you have that if you have too much sialic acid on there for too long and you have the wrong kind, you can exhaust these and it's not so good. And some of his latest work has shown that, right? So again, sialic acid can be your friend or it can be your foe or it can be both, right? So you have to be really careful. Man, these sugars. And then we have Ratmir Durda. So Ratmir is a, a member of the group who is making all sorts of really cool new tools to crack the glyco code. And this is just one example of the tools he's making. This is a, a tool called Liga. It's a, a liquid glycan array. It's on these little cool phages, which allow for DNA encoding of these sugars, which is really neat. And then what's cool about that is you can inject these into an animal and you can see where the glycans go. And you're like, well, why would you want to do that? Well, you know, we had a great talk by Ravine Narain, another member of the Institute today, all about nanoparticles that have carbohydrates on them. Right? And as it happens, people actually glycosylate drugs sometimes to get them to specific sites. So one of the things that he found in some of his, his early work that he's going through right now is that these phages that have GALNAC on them actually go really specifically to the liver. And indeed, there's a microRNA drug that's in clinic that is, has GALNAC on it as the delivery vehicle. So this is sort of the, the tip of the iceberg for what we could do. Right, if we could even make more sophisticated probes and figure out exactly how they target things, you could really, really reimagine targeting in the body, right, using sugars. And then we have Warren, so Warren Wackerchuk. And so what he does is he uses the code uh, by basically he's doing synthetic biology to make it so that we can maybe make some of these proteins go where we want them to. So tons of therapeutic proteins have sugars on them. Right, and they're really important. But also, putting sugars on therapeutic proteins that don't have them on there can change how they behave in, in your sera, which is really important because if you inject a drug, you don't want it to be gone in five minutes because it got proteolytically cleaved and that's the end of that. Right, no drug company is gonna want that. So what do they want? They want something that you can inject that will stick around long enough that it will actually do what it's supposed to do. And one of the things that helps it do that are sugars. And so the Wacker Check Lab is using synthetic biology to be able to put sugars into different proteins, some of which have them, some of which don't, um, and be able to tune them to completely change the pharmaceutical landscape and how we use these uh, proteins as drugs, right? Which is a really, really important thing to do. And with that, I have to say that you have to stay tuned for more stories from the Glyco Gang because there's so much cool stuff on the way. And this isn't even just a, this is just a small handful of the Institute. Right? Um, it is a great group of people, and I'm looking forward to all of the amazing science that's coming out of it. I also have to thank my lab, who did a lot of the research that I showed, um, and they're amazing. Um, and the Canada Excellence Research Chair Program for actually giving me the ability to do all of this and to actually help to found GIA. Um, Warren Wackertech and Glyconet for really being an inspiration in the field of getting more glyco into the general community here in Canada. And all of you for showing up for a talk on, of all things, sugars. So thank you so much for your attention.